and we wow. fight, and okay. Alan and I drink. Come on in! Yeah. Yeah. Come in. It on, is 2.05. I think we should begin this monstrosity. The only one who bites is him. Ah. <laughs> Excuse me. Bites. Oof. Come in. Really? Why? Why, 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 why you here? Then stand outside the door and tell everybody else to come in. <laughs> yeah, tell everybody else to come it's in. It's to get you, man. Right if you make it forbidden, everybody wants to come in. James. <laughs> Yeah, no, close the doors and then stand there, like, threatening. Yeah, three beers yeah, with the selection. Want to know okay. Yeah. He's by. Oh, yes. Let's get this ball rolling, guys. So, uh, thank you all for coming, you beautiful people, to the uh, our, our last uh, panel of the of this wonderful weekend. Have you enjoyed Tuscan this weekend? Yeah. Just a quick reminder, as soon as uh, registration opened, uh, opens up, get your tickets for next year so you can get them. A lot of people were not able to get in this year. Things are rolling. Things are cooking with Tuscon, and uh, and but but the committee is still committed to keeping it very small and intimate. So you know how that goes. Uh, so uh, glad you all had a great time. Let's, uh, so this panel is. Why are you always in charge? Because oh, 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 he thinks he is. The top. Ginger. Ginger is he? Where are you? That's a great question. Mark, the line charge. Excuse me. Thank you. He's in charge. Everybody on the table dies so he can be in charge. Thank you. We are the time. Anyway, this panel is about is uh, is where we uh, get together at the end of the convention, and a bunch of filmy people tell stories of their experiences on film sets, and we have a lot of fun with this. And so, why don't we uh, go around and introduce each other? Uh, in fact, why don't we start at the end of that table? And just introduce yourselves. I'm Marty Patola. I'm a local filmmaker. I've made three micro-budget films. I'm Sarah Mirasola. I am most notably a registered nerd and an actor, but the list is very, very long of the things that I do. Registered nerd. That's really good. I've never heard that before. <laughs> if, if you look at the back of your Hello, guys, nerd. Your pictures all over. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, I'm thrilled that Tim Curry's in the audience. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely <laughs> one of my favorites. Looking, looking good. I am Jeff Notkin. I am a television host. I am a film and television producer. I am a science writer. I am a whack, wacky sci-fi guy-ish. And have been hijacked by Tucson. This is my, my home. I'm originally from London, England. And I'm oh, thrilled to be no. part of this auspicious panel. I think this is the largest panel I've ever been on. Absolutely. And that's Arnold. really saying yeah. something. Nice victim. I'm uh, Paul E. Senko. I am a local indie filmmaker. I've made two micro-budget features, a couple of small projects, and uh, in addition to acting, writing, directing, producing, all the usual stuff. Uh, I'm William Malone. I'm a uh, director, writer. I uh, directed House on Haunted Hill, Fear.com, Masters of Horror, Tales from the Crypt, all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, also have made, written a couple screenplays, which were science fiction films, so which I had nothing to do with when you see them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also a major collector of movie props, so I guess. There you are. I'm John Vornholt. I'm mainly a writer, but I spent 17 years in Hollywood. I'm directing a lot now, and I spent a year working as a full time as an extra in Hollywood. So I could do about three hours on silly, crazy stories just from that experience. So I won't do three hours too long. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am Eric Schumacher. For those who don't know me, I am an actor, a director, a producer, uh, <clears throat> best known most recently for a couple of Western roles. About a year ago on a Fox TV series, I played Wyatt Earp, and uh, actually this past Friday, the world premiere screening of Alex Cox's Tombstone Rashomon. Uh, Alex Cox did Repo Man and Sid and Nancy and some, some uh, well-known movies like that, uh, premiered at the Law Film Festival, and I played Doc Holliday, uh, making me, I guess, one of maybe five or six people who ever do that, which is extraordinarily cool. Um, I also produce a variety of uh, new media stuff, and uh, I've done a bunch of indie films and so on and so on, and directed uh, the new series My Stolen Time Machine, which Woo! Sarah Mirasola over there stars in. It's um, featured on the back of Tuscon's program this year, yes. on the very back page, you know or, uh, back cover. It. You know you've made it when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm turning in career done. <laughs> I, before we go on, I just huh? I want you all to know. Criminal oh. Lines. <laughs> oh, God. Everybody thinks, thinks I look like the Criminal Shut Lines up. guy. You do. <laughs> 
Eric's too modest to say anything. Tombstone Russia Man is such a fantastic film. If you were an Alex Cox fan, you must see this new Alex Cox feature shot in Tucson. It is so Alex Cox. He kills it. It's not hard. I was there. For where can we it see it? Yeah, where? Jeez, yeah, where, where, this is intense. It has not yet been released. Uh, the, the the last night, uh, last night, or sorry, Friday night was a kind of a preview screening. They're not quite done with it. Uh, they're going to send it around to, to some of the bigger film festivals, and they have not told me what's happening after that. So I, I'll make sure everybody knows. You all know who Alex Cox is, right? Just check. Reborn man. Okay, Repo thank man. you. Hey, girl. That driving makes you stupid, man. Okay. Michael <laughs> Candela. Order of the heart. I'm Michael Candela. I took uh, Peter Pan way too seriously. I will not grow up. Uh, and uh, let's see, what do I do? That's why I won't grow up, because I kind of have more hyphens than I possibly can. Uh, let's see, I was casting director for 40 years, about 40 years in both Los Angeles and California. I produced some, some low budget stuff all the way up to five to eight million dollar movies and ended up here by accident in Tucson, but I love Tucson. And now I went back to my really true love. I'm playing Scrooge right now in A Christmas Carol. It's open soon and I will be the invitation. I get at Roadrunner? No, not at Roadrunner. No, oh, so you're not with Stephen Go. Okay. This is at the uh, Burger. It's oh, at the a, Burger. Musical. Oh. You get to see me sing off okay. key, okay. <laughs> and I do it really well. Oh. Trust me. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know what I do. I just I put hyphens after my name, and I literally I've had screenplays produced. Uh, yeah. I, I. That's what I do. Okay. In all honesty, I like to joke about it, but up until recently, I've really only had two regular jobs in my life. I've actually supported myself, sometimes well, sometimes from hand to mouth like others, but in the industry. And my favorite story is this. Will Gear, who used to be one of my acting teachers, says the true test of an artist is can he support himself and his family for his whole life. Because Will, for those of you who did not know, Will Gear not only played Grandpa in the Waltons, but was blackballed from our industry for having beliefs. Just because he went to a few meetings and liked some girl's butt. And that's the only reason he was at those meetings. Uh, then, then they called him a communist and they blackballed him. So he had to actually mop floors. But he made, mopped floors at a movie studio rather than other places. So I've managed to do that. And I'm very grateful that I've been able to do that for most of my life. My name is Bruce Wiley. I am a I am an actor. I have worked on major uh, Hollywood releases. I've worked on TV movies. I've done voice acting. I used to be a radio personality, as you can probably tell by my projection. Um, and. I also worked behind the lens as, as a stage grip and as a location escort for agrarian use, which is why I'm bringing this to you. One thing that you don't really know about most films is they have something associated with the film production itself. Usually it's a baseball cap, t-shirt, something. This is the crew hat for Transformers 2 Revenge of the Fallen. I was given it by the first assistant director for escorting them around a secured military installation during the filming. I have a lot of stories about that one too, but that's what this is here for. Mr. Lee. So my name is Brandon Lee. I'm a game designer, camera operator, assistant camera, 3D artist, etc. So, actor? Yeah. You no. act in a play? I've movie. done acting, but I'm not a good actor, so I would never say that. But, um, I will fill in the character every now. Awesome, Fuller. Ah, uh, I'm Lawrence Fuller. Um, you can call me Larry, please. Larry, Larry. Thank you. Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a local actor. Uh, I've been in the theater since I was 15. Um, as for movies, um, Camp Thir 139 up in Phoenix, uh, which was filmed around uh, 2010, uh, Matt Adams uh, directed it. Um, it, 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 was a, it was a really wonderful little film, and um, I believe, I think it's on Netflix, I'm not sure. Um, I do have a copy of it. But um, I've also been on the movie sets uh, and done some uh, um, uh, web series, and uh, 
first time uh, for me was uh, Three Kings. Um, I was an extra um, on that. And um, I'm just here to hear everybody else's stories because they're all going to be amazing. I know they are. And uh, I, uh, one thing I, I would passionately love to pursue is uh, voiceovers, voiceover actor, because I can do some voices. Okay, so let's get this ball yes. rolling. So, um, and you so should hear this guy do a British accent. He's oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's fabulous British accent. I don't know. It's not even suggested. I did a show and I did a British accent. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty close to the real thing, Jeff. Well, we were having a thing that. about the elevator this morning. It sounds Scottish. When you press the button, it says, going to. <laughs> 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 but, but, but it doesn't have no, it just going speech. I know, going up is normal. It's probably because there's a lot of boozing in Scotland. Going down. Going down. Going down. Going down. You might as well do it in the Scottish fashion. We were in the elevator. I was having a fit about it. I was going, get out of the lift. No, you don't. Get out of the lift. <laughs> Some normal people were trying to walk in at the time. I think we first. So, so you, let, me like, ask, let me ask you a question. The, the elevator is so. stuck. Does it sort of say, shake your foot? I <laughs> love so uh, where, what, what is the, I'm going to ask the panel a question. Uh, and and uh, what is the neatest place you've ever gotten to film? Place. The coolest place you've ever gotten from. Like the coldest place? I'll tell you. Like, like awesomeness. Uh, awesome, awesomeness. Awesome. Awesomeness. Some idiot <laughs> paid me. Get this. Union wages. Shoot in Italy. It's supposed to be a one month shoot. Okay? We, went, we started, we went out to. <laughs> I'm laughing. Uh, it's my wife, by the way, Marcia. Uh, she, we, we started, we went out to uh, Sorrento, and that's where we were based out of. But we basically shot for one month solid in uh, that great area, which means we went to Capri. We shot on the Isle of Capri. We shot on the beaches of Positano. At one point, believe it or not, I wasn't this fat. I did a nude <laughs> scene where we all were running into beach. The producer thought it was funny. He brought my name, my real last name, I was born with the last name of Papalardo. Casa de Mari is where all the Papalardos are from. So he introduced me to 30 people who didn't speak the same language on the day that I had to do the nude scene in Capri. Were you naked when you met them? Literally. <laughs> no, I was, I was wearing a damn robe. But we got to shoot there. And then, the, um, first of all, we, I will tell you that shooting in Italy, they are so fast. And we were using, you know, some of Zeffirelli's crews and Fellini's crews, and the people would tell me these stories, and I just w w was amazed. But it was like shooting for at least three months because of the way they shoot. They get something so quick. They don't wait for a light. They find a light for us and they bounce light and, you know, and, and things like that. So they shoot very quickly. They always get drunk at lunch. <laughs> That's a standard thing. But what they don't do well, which was the best part of this story, is after this month of shooting, they realized that the Italians don't shoot well sound. The equipment was so old, the sound. So they had to loop the bloody movie. So they took us to Rome for another month and a half. <laughs> well, I'm the stage actor, so I'm pretty clear even doing a movie in what I do, right? So I could actually not have to loop. But the, I had to be there with, and I got to spend a month and a <laughs> half a in Rome at their dollar, hanging out, getting drunk and uh, drinking coffee, with the producers, while everybody else had to loop the whole movie. I think I have an associated story. Okay, and, take it away. Uh, this is this is actually <coughs> film related, but I wasn't involved in the film exactly at the time. Um, before I started my life in film crime as a filmmaker, <laughs> I uh, <coughs> uh, was building props, and I got a call from Gene Roddenberry's office to make some. Uh, phasers and communicators because they were thinking about making a movie 
uh, you know, Star Trek, the motionless picture. <laughs> so they, they uh, so I built some props and made some phasers and communicators. And and uh, Gene Roddenberry's office had called me up and said, "Well, go over to Gene's, and he wants you to drop by his house and show him the props." I said, "Okay, great." So I get in my car, drive to West Hollywood, or West LA actually, and uh, uh, I knock on the door. And after a few seconds, Gene Roddenberry shows up stark naked. <laughs> we have the entire meeting with him stark naked. Uh, fortunately, we sat down at a table, and so I didn't have to look at his junk. And uh, Major Barrett came out and handed us lemonade, and that was my What was meeting. she wearing? Yeah, what was she wearing? <laughs> unfortunately, she wasn't stark naked. Oh. <laughs> So that was, and I, I later talked to. Did he uh, like the props? He did like the props, but yeah. la later I, I uh, uh, talked with um, uh, Chekhov. What's his name? Uh, uh, Walter, Walter Koenig. Walter Koenig. Yeah. And I asked him if this was normal behavior. He said, "Not that he knew of, but it could be." You know, <laughs> could have started that way. That's great. Are we still on the topic We're of what's the, the coolest topic of place? Awesome coolest, coolest place. place How many people have been to the Canary Islands? Sure. There you go. Well, yeah, yeah, you're course, British. Of course. Yeah. I, I, I lived there for three years and made a lot of sauerkraut westerns there. I was a stunt man. I only had, I, well, for some reason, this was in the early 70s, and for some reason, of course, the Italians all went to Spain. Whether, whether the Canary Islands are in Spain too, but they're off the coast of Africa. But for some reason, the Germans love to go there. If you've been there, you know it's like Germany South, right? <laughs> I, I mean, and there's no Americans there. I, if I ask you if you've been to Canary Islands, so I spent two and a half years there dressed as a cowboy working in a western town, and we made movies one after another, and sometimes I'd have a little part. But anyway, so the Canary Islands are a really cool place. There's a cowboy town there that's just like old Tucson. Do you remember that? I, Canyon don't, de I did not see the Wild West Town. No, I went for the volcanoes. Well, they have beautiful are volcanoes <laughs> there, too. It's a fantastic place, though. I remember it was the worst taxi ride I'd ever had, and the guy was in two accidents in oh. one drive. <laughs> in one of the so the Geologic Observatory. He managed to hit two cars. That sounds and my, yeah, right? He was probably from Rome, actually. <laughs> yeah, my brother almost went over into the front seat. Yeah, it's an accident. exciting place to yeah, visit. Yeah, it's a about three hours to do a ten-minute ride because he smashed into two cars. But I, no, I loved it. I, I think, gosh, it's so difficult for me to pick a favorite place. When we were doing the Meteorite Men show for Discovery, we filmed in 11 countries on four continents. And my probably my favorite memory was actually the last episode that we did, and we went to NASA Dryden in Northern California, which is where they built the space shuttles, and it is a giant NASA base. And I was not told what we were doing because they loved to surprise me and because I get super excited and really geek out on things obviously and so the bigger the surprise the more freaky I get so we go to NASA Dryden and we're driving and driving and I didn't see the big NASA sign I go wait what's going on here oh it's NASA Dryden what are we doing here and we go through this big security thing it was like trying to get it into Area 51 uh, yeah actually <laughs> you know it was higher security than Area 51 oh my. we had it is the first time I ever had an eye a, an eye picture scan? taken oh, of me, yeah, oh, wow. and fingerprints, and there's armed guards, and, and they did say to me, bring your passport and your driver's license and your birth certificate, like, what are we going back to Russia, and they could just bring everything, so they confiscate all that while you're going, and then we walk into the hangar, and there is Sophia, and Sophia is a, is a 747 SP uh, uh, Boeing jet, and it has a 17-ton telescope set, set in the back that was built oh. in Germany. Oh. And it, SOFIA stands for Stratospheric uh, Infrared, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we got to go on board, and it mm. is it is nerd central in there. It is, a, imagine a 747, and all the seats have been taken out, and there's a 17-ton telescope in it, and there are all these computer stations, and they're all named things like Galactica and Stargate, yes. and everything on board <laughs> is named I after Stargate. So, I, I got to sit in the pilot seat, and then there's this really cool uh, little kind of first-class lounge area, and I'm sitting there with all these NASA geniuses, the guys that run the program, and guys that design spaceships and everything and they're filming this and we're sitting around the table and I go okay I'm gonna ask you a question and I don't want you to think about it I just want you to give me an instantaneous answer yes or no it's yes you put your hand up and so I said is there 
life of some form, some sort, elsewhere in the universe. And everybody at that table put their hand up instantaneously. And that, and then at the end, as I was leaving, they go, wait, don't go yet, we got something for you. And they brought out an official <coughs> NASA jacket with my name on it, and the meteorite men oh, 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 right. oh, 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 oh. Mission number eight. I put the jacket on and my co-host was killing himself laughing and I go, what do you think is so funny? He goes, you are never going to take that jacket off. <laughs> are you running under that jacket? Yeah, I'm always like, that's <laughs> So that was my favorite, I guess. Pretty awesome. Anybody else, the uh, coolest place you've ever gotten well, to work well, from? Yeah, just, uh, uh, I did a show at uh, Tales from the Crypt in England, which was the only time they, they did one. And I got to work at Ewing Studios. Cool. And it was amazing. But it was in the winter time. And the only thing that was weird about it is, for some reason, the Brits don't like closing the big doors. I'm talking about the giant stage doors, you know. So we're filming in there. And because that involves making a decision. <laughs> no, 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 you do. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, you don't want to do it. No, please. I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. It was freezing in there. Like I said, can't somebody close the big doors? You know? But what's cool was, was I was doing a, a graveyard scene, and they had built this wonderful graveyard set in, in the, uh, on the stage. And it was... I'm a huge fan of like the Hammer movies, you know. So, yeah. so it was great having the first AD come up and go, "Oh right, Governor, what's next?" You know? <laughs> and I was, wow, look at this. <laughs> it was very, very cool. But I, I, one other thing about the Ewing Studios is they have a guard. You know, you have to get go through the guard shack to get into the studio, like at every other studio. And I went there. I was there every day for like a month and a half. And every time I went in. The guard would go, uh huh, and what's your name? And what's your... and I said, it's I was so here English. yesterday. I've been coming for 15 days now. Yes, right. What's your name? You know, <laughs> like, okay, never did recognize me after all. Though he probably did, it's just he thought it might embarrass you if he admitted that he remembered you, because it would imply that he'd been paying attention the previous day. Maybe you can explain this to me. It was, and we were in the middle of a take, not a scene, but a take, and they pulled the plug. They said, no, oh, it's 5 Oh, God, that Time is to go so to tea time. Pop, you know? No, it is everything stops. Yeah. The, this concept of, well, let's just finish like we, like we would do it here in the States. Out. I moved here for a reason. You're in the middle of something. It's Not 5 o'clock. Let's you know, do an extra 10 minutes and we'll film yeah. the thing. No one's going to freak out. In England, ah, oh, sorry. Or tea break. The yeah. classic joke is you go somewhere you're driving around in the UK and you see roadworks and there's seven guys and there's one guy digging and there's six guys standing around drinking tea watching him do it. Yeah, but, well, they, they literally, oh, we were in the middle of a take and literally the camera shuts off, lights yeah. go out. I, I'm, I'm a musician and I, I played in the punk scene in London oh, in, yeah. in, the, in the punk years and the, even the punk rock clubs were so specific. The band had, you had to go off stage by 10.40. That was it. And then... At, Everyone, the audience exiting at 10.45. At 11 p.m. on the dot, that building was shut down. Everybody was out. There was no extra, oh, just let them do one more song. No, no, sorry, mate. Time's up. No, no. no it is no, the same good. way. Shut right down. Time to eat, bowl, and drink. And eat. Eat, 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 I had a chance to go on an, uh, a wonderful set. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't working on the show. Uh, the set, set was on a big flatbed truck that was right between the stage and the movie departments at UCLA, where I was a senior. And I saw that thing, and I couldn't believe it. There was, UCLA, yeah. Yeah, there was nobody around there, so I climbed on there to explore it and looked all around, and it was the bridge of the original Enterprise. Oh, oh, oh. Lucky you. And I, I, discovered, I discovered that the, the distance between the captain's chair and Uhura's a console was two steps. Wow. And everything was shot with a super wide angle lens, so it seemed like it was forever. So I got to take a look at the super sophisticated computer. Oh. Where are you? <laughs> and on the back, it's all made out of plywood. And on the back side, someone had taken a ruler and had uh, drawn a grid of pencil lines and then taken an electric drill, just <laughs> missing all of them, so it was kind of wobbly. And then it is clear that they've gone down to a surplus electronic place to buy a shoebox full of pilot lights. And some of them had chrome bezels, and some of them had black bezels, and different shapes, and different colors, and some of them had no bezels, and they were just shoved in there, and then it was wired into three circuits. That was it. That was the computer. 
But who knew from watching a TV show that it wasn't this super sophisticated thing? It really taught me quite a lot about showbiz magic. But it was so, it was just an amazing place to be, the original, the original Enterprise. Wow. Okay, before we go on, is this not a cool panel? Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please get cheesy. Please. That's the whole point of this panel. It comes out of honesty, and you recognize the honesty, and that's why it makes you go like, mm-hmm, nobody actually feels that way. Um, I'm not as well established as everybody else here, so the coolest place I've been is the creation of the director's minds that we're trying to do, you know, be flicking and seeing plywood in somebody's garage, in the basement, in somebody's living room, come to life and, and actually look like what she wanted it to be is the coolest thing for me, so. Yeah. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, That's none of us is going to argue that, right? No. <laughs> the, the set that you've the, done on Stolen Time Machine. Can I, can I mention what it's called, the, the particular? Yeah, yeah. So on, on my Stolen Time Machine, the ship's name is Memento Tempest, and it has some really beautiful, uh, Eric and Ginger and Drew and who, who and everybody built that set from blood, sweat, tears, uh, how do we do this? Tin foil. Uh, how do we do this? Who knows? Like, I'm just gonna go with it. And there's some really beautiful Easter eggs on that set. It's finally released. So yeah, you know, we created the the door with a, a box with a piece of cardboard that could lift up and uh, with yeah. a light shining through it. And we make every other effect with lights. <laughs> and it's beautiful and wonderful because it's it's somebody's creation coming to life from their brain. I, the coolest place I've ever been was in somebody's brain. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and then you get this guy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. Who, who, made it, who made it and it all work. <laughs> and it was delicious, too. Uh, Anybody else? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, please, please. No, I don't want to. No, by all means, sir. No, I, I just want to. He's really not in charge. It's okay. No, I'm, <laughs> I just, I'm just acting. This is an just an act. Act. Yeah. It's all no acting. This, this was just a very cool place, but but I have to tell you the story because I, I had a, developed a project with H.R. Giger, you know, who uh, yeah. designed the alien. We would know that here. And, and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> literature people, I don't know, you know. <laughs> But anyway, um, so I flew. To, they sent me to, to Zurich to work with him, and I, you know, went to his place, and um, which was an amazing place. I'll tell you a couple stories. Uh, uh, one is which is his artwork was stacked against the walls, like about five feet thick, and I'm walking around his place, and I look at one of these massive paintings that he has, and I go, Giger, somebody uh, damaged your painting there. It's got some stains." It's, it's, he goes, no, that's why my girlfriend, she blew her brains out. <laughs> and absolutely true. He, she shot herself in front of the painting, and it's he kept it there as part of the artwork. Oh, shit. So, oh. Uh, my, but my second story is, 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 is funnier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Almost anything is funnier than that. <laughs> so, so, so Giger takes, he liked to be called Giger, and he, instead of Kara Giger or whatever. Anyway, so he took me to this biker bar. Now, we're in Switzerland, mind you, Geneva, right? Uh, so he takes me to this biker bar, and it's what you'd expect out of, you know, a lot of guys in, in you know... Biker. Yeah, you know, and the, the bikes are all ro lined up out front, and, you know, and, and uh, we go in, and, and, you know, it's a bunch of very tough-looking guys with piercings and, you know, <laughs> little leather jackets and stuff like that. And, and uh, we're sitting there having, having uh, you know, coffee and stuff. And I hear these guys talking, and they're speaking in English. And I said, Giger, what's the deal? Why are they speaking in English? You know, this is a German speaking. He goes, well, you know, it's considered very cool to be speaking English if you're a biker. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm listening. And I swear to God, this is the conversation I overheard. There's two guys there, and he goes, uh, Fritz, you know, I think we should go and buy some spray paint and spray paint the name of our club on the sides of some buildings. The other guy goes, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's check with the police first to make sure this is okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a funny thing. That's pretty awesome. It's true. <laughs> okay, let me change the topic up. Uh, how about, what is the, uh, oh, and, 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 and when I say the, I mean we're going to have lots of different stories, so pick one. Uh, most challenging place you've ever worked in film? Yeah, 
most challenging place you've ever I got a story. Okay. Let's I heard that. No. I'll jump in here. I was an extra on a movie, and I'll ask if anybody's seen this movie, Mike's Murder with Deborah Winger. And a bunch of it was James Brooks. It was a big it was a big movie that bombed. It was a big movie so it was that bombed. James L. Brooks. No. Uh, it, but it was it was uh, it was a, a murder mystery, Mike's murder, and Deborah Winger, who's very nice. She she actually talked to the extras. That's how nice she is. I mean, that's really truly amazing if you know that. Anyway, they had a the room where the murder. They were filming in Los Angeles in a uh, apartment building that was about to be torn down, so they could do anything they wanted to, to with it. And Hollywood loves that. Okay, they love that. Like like you know whatever. And somebody had this great reason. I was I was one of the people who were supposed to be living there in this apartment and hear something and come out of their. Uh, ho come out of their apartment in their pajamas and robe and stuff and walk down and look into this room where the murder was. Well, in their infinite wisdom, these producers of Mike's Murder had used real cow's blood oh. and had used real cow's oh. blood and slopped it all over the walls of this room mm -hmm. where the yeah. murder was supposed to be. So we were supposed to walk in there and look horrified. A bunch of us were standing around the building around the, and look in there and we were all... <laughs> we were, maybe they did it that way just so when the extras for, walked in there the first time, the stench, you could, you could smell it from like 50 feet away and you got in there and was like... We were like, we look pretty horrified. And in fact, I never saw this before, although every extra hopes this will happen. Every extra hopes, you know, they'll get picked and given a line. And yeah. suddenly they'll be a SAG actor, right? No. And so I never saw that except this one time, this guy beside me, young guy, he said, oh, that was gross, or he said it like that. And he wasn't supposed to say shit. And, and the director's there, and he said, you know, I think we're going to keep that. And you are now a <laughs> SAG actor. <laughs> he should have gotten fired for doing that because he was not an actor at all. So anyway, that was the worst place That's I ever awesome. was in. That was awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, years ago, and I do mean years ago, it had to be 15 years ago or 20, wait a minute, we weren't even married. It's got over 20 years ago. I shot a film on Maui. Beautiful idea, right? Shoot a film on Maui, the locations are wonderful. And I had written the screenplay with my partner. And the problem is, is 20 years, some odd years ago, they didn't have film equipment. Plus, the film takes place primarily on a boat. Oh. Oh. It was, oh. Man. and <laughs> Frank Stallone is in the movie. Now, Frank Stallone is not the nicest actor I've ever worked with. So, needless to say, that was very, very tough, because we put, we, the locations were wonderful, but we were not prepared not to have crews that couldn't shoot on boats, and it was, and obviously people kept getting seasick, and it just went on and on. And here we are in the most beautiful area of the world, but I could not wait until that was over because just the problems every day was a new problem. Of course, now they have film studios on Maui. And it's very easy to get crews and all the rest, but we were one of the people who proved the island of Maui you could actually shoot on it. Well, I've got a boat story too, but hey, Brian's yeah. also a boat story. There you go. So we're, we're, doing the, we're doing the venture show, we're filming on Lake Mead in Arizona, oh, okay. and oh. we wanted to get, well, <laughs> I had an amphibious vehicle because we were all asked if you could have anything on the show, what would it be? You know, yeah. sensible like sensible suggestions for things that we could use. So I said an amphibious vehicle because who wouldn't want an amphibious vehicle? And they cost seventy five thousand dollars. So they, they lent me one for nearly a year. It was brilliant. So my idea was we were going to take the amphibious vehicle down the boat ramp and across Lake Mead because we wanted to get to the north shore of Lake Mead, which is so dangerous. You cannot get out there by any conventional means. Wow. Cannot land a helicopter there. It's where the green Mojave Rattler lives, which is, has a deadly neurotoxin. And you cannot, the Park Service will not let people go out there. It took us six months to get permission. 
And so then we get permission, the park service goes, no, no, you can't use the, you can't take the amphibious vehicle. And I go, well, that's the whole point of this stupid <laughs> thing. We're going to drive it down. My co-host to me, it'll be so cool. It'll be like D-Day in reverse. We drive down the ramp into the lake, and then we're going to tear across, and then we're going to make a big landing. No, no, you're not allowed to do that. And I go, well, why not? And they go, well, we're just afraid it will encourage other people to do the same thing. And I go, oh, yeah, so all the other people who live in Mojave County that have, a, you know, their own amphibious <laughs> vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> So instead they go, use the houseboat. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a company there and they rent boats. So most of them are little boats. And there's this half million dollar houseboat. So I call my staff that are coming up from Tucson. And I go, go to the Army Navy store, get the cheekiest captain's hat you can find. So they come up, this really silly, you know, the white captain's hat with the yellow robe and the flat visor. You've all seen them on. Uh, um, Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island. Island. Yeah. So I go, I'm going to be in charge of this. I'm English. I know all about the yeah. Navy. I'm, 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 I'm going to captain the ship. Everything will be fine. Rum, in the land. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. <laughs> Good codes reference. So, so we take the boat over. My co host on the boat and one camera team and another camera team's in a little boat. The producer's in another little boat. And we've got to take this gigantic thing. I've got to take this gigantic thing into a little tiny inlet called Little Boro Bay and make a landing and then we're going to get out and film. So <clears throat> I have captain boats before but I doubt any of them were more than about 12 feet long. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just always up for a challenge. I go, oh, I know what I'm doing, everybody shut up. So we take, I get across the lake, that's no problem and then we get into Little Boro Bay and it's, uh, it really was a bull in a china shop situation. I've got this giant boat, it's got two enormous engines, and I'm in the bay, and I'm trying to get it close, and Steve, my co-host, jumps off, and he gets, so he goes, I'll direct you from the side. So he gets over, he's on the rock, and he's yelling at me, he's going, Jeff, back it up. And the director's in one boat, and he's filming, he's going, Jeff, go forward. And the producer's going, wait, wait, you're going to crash it on this side. And then I realize there's an enormous submerged boulder, and I'm just about, I'm just about to beach the thing. And I get up on the bridge and I go, if one more person says one more goddamn thing, I'm going to smash the boat into the side and it's a half million dollar boat. So everyone shuts up and then my, the, my DP standing there in a the little boat, he's going like this. And I, I, I yell at him and I go, what's your problem? And he goes, that's great television. <laughs> realize that the shoot on a boat, you have to have two boats. That was great that you brought that up. Okay? Because, you know, you can't just shoot on that boat. You've got to have a second boat so it can shoot while the characters are on the front of it. It doesn't magically appear. <laughs> Anybody else? Challenging experience or challenging places that you have filmed? I'm kind of looking at you. I know you have I know, you know all that. Like yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> um, <I'm, laughs> I've never been in one that was too difficult to overcome, I can say. <laughs> well, challenging. You know, um, but the, the most challenging, I think, like stress-wise, was on a C5 Galaxy going to the Middle East, and then a month later coming back. Oh my God. Because then a quarter of the seats were empty. And you had to sit on that thing for 20 hours, like, missing the guys. And that sucked. Oh, that sucks. Cool. So it was like, the 20-hour flight there was kind of harrowing, because... <laughs> You leave out of New York and you go over to Germany, get on another aircraft, you shift all the containers over, and then you take another almost 16-hour flight down to the Middle East. But you do all of that in like one stint. It's like you don't sleep through that time. So um, it's a packed, crammed vehicle. It's about half the size of this thing. But you've got to get up into the riggings. You've got to run your lights and stuff because we're doing interviews at the same time. The Air Force doesn't want you to do that. But we're trying to get little interviews wherever we can, talking to these guys and... A bunch of like airmen, a bunch of marines are going over with us. So it, it was it was just really just like heart wrenching hearing them go off and be excited to go because most of them was the first tour, and then coming back and doing that again. And you have to sit there for just like almost an entire day just contemplating with all these guys who come back through hell, and you're just like, okay, so we have to film these guys. We have to get them to talk. We have to get them. Personable. We have to get him enough to get a message out, and most of those messages for almost a day are just like, "Well, I, I got my bell rung pretty bad, and I lost a couple of my buddies, or I know somebody else who died, or I'm going home to my wife who's got three kids, she's leaving me because I've been over there too long." And yeah. So that was that was the most challenging. Set. I saw an interesting statistic. In World War II, the average 
a fighting man fought for 50 days in active combat a year. I would, I would in World War II, yeah. in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the average U.S. fighting man in a year fights 248 days. Wow. <coughs> Just so you know, it was 50 days in World War II, and in, in, in recent wars, it's 248 days of active out there fighting. Wow. So I got a story. Uh, that, that was awesome. <laughs> I got a story. Uh, this is actually very recent, and it involves these two people sitting up in the front here on a recent project we worked on. This is one of the better uh, camera camera crews in town, by the way, Bobby and Lisa Francis. Okay. Uh, so we worked on a, uh, we on a recent uh, uh, crime drama series, which uh, cannot be named yet, and I can't say much about yet. Um, and uh, this was actually local here in town. We were shooting at the top of the Pennington Garage. Uh, downtown, and, uh, yeah, pretty much every they're very fun. And, uh, and and however, we made the mistake of shooting a critical dialogue scene on Halloween weekend this year. And uh, um, and and I had uh, in my character, I had uh, um, the bulk of my dialogue. The big reveals were happening based on the schedule and you know and, and just the way that things fell over the night. At about two a.m., when all the bars let out on Halloween weekend, Saturday night. And uh, so I was, you know, and, and, and this, is, this was a role that required extreme focus. I'm trying to pull, you know, emotional stuff out of this big monologue that I have. And in the meantime, there are sirens going off. There are cars crashing. There are people screaming. There are people coming, trying to come onto the set like, where's my car? And <laughs> there, was a gal, there was a gal who I'm pretty sure was on something pretty major who actually tried to pick a fight with. Uh, some of our crew, be because we wouldn't let her just hang out while she was, like, ah! you know, she was like, I, I, like on heroin or something. And uh, in the meantime, I'm trying to focus and get through my lines. And so I, I pulled out every single technique I have as an actor for concentration. It was extraordinarily challenging. I flubbed it a bunch of times and finally got through one really good solid take, and no one yells cut. And okay, so I'm just, I'm just trying to stay in character. No one yells cut. Director uh, Alan Williams comes up to me, goes right in front of the camera and gives me a gigantic hug and says, you did it, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, how about this funny experiences on a set? Something that you think is really, really hysterical, whether it was funny at the time or funny in retrospect. Ah, Mr. Bullenholz. I got another extra story. Please. In the movie Night Shift, Michael Keaton and yes. Fonzie, yes. The, the party scene at the end, Oh yeah. We have a girl on your back, and they suddenly said, "Extra hundred bucks for any girl who takes her top off." Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the one on my back didn't. <laughs> but oh. the, some of the, a lot of the other ones did. If you watch that movie, you will see oh all the girls are fairly well dressed. They're all playing hookers, obviously. But then, then all of a sudden, about half of them are naked. Top up. So anyway, so I thought that was a brilliant assistant director thing. A hundred bucks for anybody who takes their top. If they'll give me a hundred bucks, <laughs> I, I would have to. Actually, we don't even have to give you a hundred bucks. Do we? <laughs> you know how this goes. Yeah, I do. My, my first project was Death Magic, and uh, it has two uh, things about it that are kind of nice to know. It was the second movie made in Arizona using only people from Arizona, and uh, it was also 15 years ago. I was told that you can't be a real Tucson science fiction fan unless you've seen Death Magic, which means, yes, I did make a cult movie, but the cult is very, very small. <laughs> so uh, I'm, uh, it's my first movie, and I'm shooting this uh, sex scene. The newlyweds are in there. They get, uh, they get killed in a very brutal way. And uh, my, my uh, female actor is uh, totally comfortable the whole situation. The guy was not so comfortable at all. He was really quite nervous. And uh, I'm right next to the bed, and there's got five lines before the action is happening. And, and uh, they go through the scene, and it's just really kind of quiet. And I, I turn to the sound guy and say, we're going to need some more boom. And so he brings the boom in a little bit closer. And I say, OK, uh, we'll take from the top. Action. And my, my, my wonderful actress, Nadine, immediately starts flailing and moaning and screaming and humping like crazy. Like, cut, 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 what is it? He said, I thought you said you wanted more boom. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> it, it, it totally devastated the guy. <laughs> wonderful. It was a wonderful.
wonderful movie. When I made That's my funny. when I made my first movie, I made a little movie called Scared to Death, which was made for like seventy four thousand dollars. This is nineteen eighty, and uh, there was a, a guy who was on a soap opera who was going to star in it. His name was Rick Springfield. <gasps> and, oh, okay. And, his girl. And he mm-hmm. yeah, and his girlfriend was also in the movie and, and that's in fact how I got to him because she was like a waitress at a at a restaurant I went to and I thought she was a good actress so I hired her and, and Rick came along with it. Now keep in mind I'm spending my own money which is you know the first time I did that which was I did it unfortunately again but the, anyway um, so we're supposed to start shooting the next morning. The night of the night before it's about eight o'clock at night it's pouring rain in Los Angeles, which almost never happens. And I get this call from Rick going, you know, I was thinking about it, and I don't think I can be in your movie. I went, Rick, it's 8 o'clock at night. And we're supposed to start shooting tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking God. about it, and I'm, I'm going to miss my acting lessons. <laughs> what the heck? Went, what? You want to run that one by me again? <laughs> said, yeah, I'm going to miss my acting lessons, so I, I don't think I can be in your movie. Ew. Okay, oh, all right. So I, I hang up, and I'm th- and my brain's spinning. I'm going, I gotta shoot tomorrow morning. I'm going, what can I possibly do? And I remembered this guy who was in the same acting troupe as as Robin Williams, and uh, and um, uh, and I, I so I called him up and I said, I said, uh, look, I, I've got this movie, and would you mind being in? Blah blah. Anyway, I no more hang up than the phone rings again. It's Rick. I've changed my mind. I'll be in your oh, room. Oh, 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 <laughs> so the other guy, John Stinson, I called up John. I said, John, here's what's happened. You know, and I, I, I said, you know, please forgive me. Uh, you know, Rick was supposed to be in the movie. Hang up. Ring. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, God. God. It's Rick Springfield. Oh, my again. God. And he goes, yeah, I just can't be in your movie. I, <laughs> you know, I just Jeez. can't do it. I said, fine, Rick, don't call me back, okay? <laughs> so I hang up, I called up John, he, he uh, rushes over, you know, in the pouring rain, grabs the script and runs off, and we shot the movie with, with John Stinson instead. Now, there, is a, there was a sort of getting back for this, because cause we, uh, we shot a scene with John and Rick's girlfriend, and it was a nude scene, and oh, so um, oh. in order to get them loosened up, I did applied them a little wine, you know, and they fell in love right there. Oh you know? my God! So, <laughs> so, I called, so later on, next time I saw Rick, I said, or next time I saw John, I said, well, how does it feel to have Jesse's girl? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be t- oh, so anybody yeah. else? Funny yeah. stories. Funny stories. Funny stories? Yeah. Yes, funny. Uh, um, I, I guess I can get funny, gross, everything. Um, uh, the last thing I did was a student film for PCC, a student, and it was called Killing Mrs. Birmingham. I played Mrs. Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I actually, uh, yeah, yeah, right. I, I w- wig, um, full length dress, uh, he wouldn't let me shave, so I, I, I had uh, growth. I had uh, hair coming out of here. I was supposed to be a Russian. It's, it's really, <laughs> yeah, it was very, very strange. Big red wig. Um, look it up on, on YouTube. I think it, he made it, and he wanted to show it at that loft uh, Friday night uh, thing there, and of course it got gone. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I would say probably the most embarrassing thing that I've ever made, but the most fun that I've ever had on a set. Uh, uh, what it happens is uh, the killing Mrs. Birmingham, uh, by the way, I'm supposed to be a teacher, and these students are supposed to kill me. Now, the, the guy who filmed the, the thing, he played one of the students, and, and he was wearing this weird outfit. It's supposed to take place in the, in the, in the future. He, he's wearing like a thong. And and um, and fur and it's just really really freaky looking and uh, um, they, they're supposed to bury me and so uh, in the back of his uh, trailer yeah the guy lived in a uh, single um, single wide he uh, way out there off of Ajo which is like way out there near three uh, 
three point. Three, three point, yeah. Um, digs a hole and everything, and I'm telling you, I didn't want to do it at first, but I I, I did it, you know, because uh, he was going to pay me a little bit, and he paid me a little bit to do it. Um, well, he had to pay me. I mean, I'm no no way I was going to. I mean, there's even a scene where I'm, I'm smoking a cigar and I quit smoking too, so I, I had to hold the cigar, and I have a bottle of vodka and I'm lifting weights, dressed as Mrs. Birmingham. Ooh, okay. okay. Seriously, I think that made it to the YouTube video. So, yeah, I, you would definitely want to look yeah, that one up. Um, I would say that was, that was probably the most strangest. I mean, I uh, in Camp 139, I was a teacher. You know. Big deal in the front, in the beginning of the movie. I'm a, I'm a teacher, and I thought that was great. But but here comes Mrs. Birmingham, and I was like, okay, <laughs> why not for the uh, the for the acting and, uh, of it? And um, yeah. I, you know, I even had to do an accent and deep voice. And oh my gosh, he uh, got me into one. I got you into one. Yeah, the last one. Okay. What did I do? So, what, what, the student <laughs> film? Right. No, 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 no. It was, it was actually a big deal. I didn't even oh. realize it. So oh, that he, thing. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. The, uh, the music video. Yeah, yeah. So, he introduced me to somebody. They said they're looking for somebody to play a, a rough biker, you know, in the scene. Fine. They, I auditioned, you know. <laughs> Eric set me up just with the audition and all. He was nice enough to do that. And I got hired. And, uh, so I'm on the set, and you know, and the director says, you, you know, in part of it, you lean over and you stare at this girl's ass, and you deliver your lines, and I'm staring at her ass, and I'm delivering the lines. She was actually very, very young, and not really particularly attractive to me, but because, uh, you know, but I, you know, I, I did my acting job, and I, I leave the set, and the phone rings. I pick up the phone. <coughs> now I coach actors sometimes for free especially for high school students and stuff like that. And the phone rings. Are you aware that that young lady is a twin? The one who played the I main character? No, I yeah, she's a twin, and I coach her twin. Oh, who's seriously? a boy who's 6'2". This it. girl was 5 nothing, And he says, Mr. Candela, why were you staring at my sister's <laughs> ass? <laughs> Yeah, luckily I wasn't there when she took her top off and stuff, or I would have really been really embarrassed. Oh, oh. Yeah. oh man, that's fine. <laughs> I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. That's really I was in a, a short student film uh, called Salad Days. The student, it was a junior film on Anna Humphreys uh, two years ago. It was released with the, uh, not a dream in widescreen, Magic Hour, right? Um, and on set, I was playing, it, it, it plays with gender, sex, things, stuff. So I'm about to have sex with a male, but I'm wearing a strap on. And you know, Whoa. like, and a lacy, and a lacy little top and men's boxers that are purple and bananas. These are my clothes, by the way. And, <laughs> and so the scene was supposed to just be that the female's ex-girlfriend is walking in on what's about to happen, you know? Um, and in the moment before, Anna's just like, okay guys, I want you to just improv some dialogue like you're about to do this. We're actors, we go, okay, and we go for it. And, when, and, and they yell cut, and we wait for a second, and the entire, you know, and I'm looping this thing up, and we're just, oh yeah, babe, you know, rave and everything, and the cut, and the entire film set, because we're all shoved in Anna's bedroom, right? just loses it and we have to break for like 10 minutes and like we can't we can't we just, uh, you guys killed it and we just we can't even deal with what you I can't even look at you right now <laughs> where can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> it was it was on YouTube if um yeah sal salad days Anna Humphreys salad days it so. might come up it's it go, you know students it comes on and no, off it comes on and off the internet depending on who they're trying to be and who they're trying to impress in LA oh I thought you were talking about might be on YouTube Red oh, now strap on. Have to pay. <laughs> ironically that was the same strap on I used in another student film but hey I don't know if read the scripts. I read the script. I agreed to it. Okay, so it is. We have 18 sticker on the door for this one. Is everyone over the age of 18? All right, we're good. There you go. For some reason, I don't understand. The last four 
roles I've had in film, I have died bloody on screen, and one of them was even a student-made claymation. So uh, <laughs> there's something about me that he killed makes you an people want to have. <laughs> they killed you an effigy. <laughs> oh, oh, no. I desperately enjoy I had to speak ancient Egyptian. Egyptian. <laughs> so it is now uh, two fifty nine p.m. and as a tradition with this particular panel being the, being the last panel of Tusk time, we just kind of keep going until they kick us out. So uh, if anyone needs to leave, you're welcome to. If anyone is, is it okay if I run to the leave, you're welcome to. But, uh, but that's kind of the way that's kind of the way this panel goes. So. Okay. Hey, tell me that. I want to say something. We're over time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, really. Do we get time and a half for this? Uh, is she gonna bring the? Is she bring the strap on? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't know it. That one's oh, not double mine. time. It's Sunday. Oh, that's right. Anyway, that that one. One. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say one of my favorite oh, things that happened to me when I was making a house on Haunted Hill. Um, you know, we Jeffrey Rush was like at the top of my yes. list of people that I wanted to work with. You know, and and. Um, at the time, he was going to the Academy Awards for, I think it was Elizabeth, I think was the movie. And, uh, you know, so he showed up uh, uh, to meet with me and, and the producers and stuff. And, and uh, he told me that just that night, or the night before, he'd seen The Black Cat with uh, Boris Karloff and mm -hmm. Bela Lugosi, and you're, you're my Great guy. And I, but, I, but I said, Jeffrey, no offense to me, but you're going to the Academy Awards for, you know, Elizabeth. Why do you want to be in House on Haunted Hill? He goes, well, I'm, I'm rather uh, tired of playing men in tights. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be an action hero. Uh, 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 I, I have a request from, from Rebecca huh? to tell a story, a location filming story from last year, uh, which a couple of you know. But it did, it did gain me a moniker in the Tucson steampunk community, and I'll, I'll explain how this happened. So it was a year ago, August, I think, I was filming with the Canadian director, a very talented guy, on a, a big budget science documentary called The Connected Universe. And I, uh, one of my areas of, of expertise is meteorites. I, I'm a meteorite specialist. And he wanted to do a meteorite segment. So we go up to the White Stallion Ranch, northwest of Tucson, which is a very famous film location. Winchester 73 was shot there, and High Chaparral, and for decades there have been all kinds of great film and TV made up there. And he's, he's, a very, he's a very charismatic guy, the director. He goes, oh, I, I, I've got this big industrial drone, and we're going to do this fantastic shot, and I, I want it to be like this. So you're going to be standing out here in the wilderness with your metal detector, but you're looking for meteorites, and we're gonna bring the drone over close to you, and then it's gonna zoom up to 1,500 feet, top speed, and then we're gonna run the film backwards, and it's gonna look like a meteorite comes down out of space and hits you. And it was funny that he said that, because immediately after that, there was a freak gust of wind which flipped the drone, and it <laughs> smacked into me so hard that it knocked me over, and the engine's a four-engine drone, a big one, it did not, the engines did not cut out, and my director ran over and pulled the drone off, meaning he got 200 cactus spikes in his legs. Oh! So, Ouch! So my, my crew were up there, and, and some of you know my COO, Beth Carrillo, she's a pretty tough lady, and she's very protective of me, and so they're on the walkie-talkies, they're going, oh my god, Jeff's been injured, he's been hit by the drone. So she goes, Jeff's been injured, everybody get out of the way. So she rushes over, <laughs> and my director of photography is kind of half carrying me back to the truck, and I've got a handkerchief on my head, and there's blood everywhere. Yeah. And uh, so it hit me here, and flipped over, and hit me in this shoulder. So I'm standing next to the truck, and Beth comes up, she goes, oh my god, are you okay, are you okay? And I hand her my phone, pull out my phone, and I go, take a photo, post it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Part of that story, which was you were asking, did, did you get the yeah, shot? Yeah, so there's more. The so we sit down, I, I've got a concussion, and I'm in shock, and the director's standing there, my DP's standing there, both going, oh my god, we've killed Jeff, oh no, ah. <laughs> And so the, the DP's upset because he's my friend, the director's upset because he's not going to get to the scene in this film. <laughs> and I go, did we, get, did we get the shot? And they're kind of standing there going, oh yeah, it's probably fine. And I go, that sounds awful, let me see the playback. You know, with the hanky like this. So the shot is basically me standing there, the drone's looking at me, and then it goes, BAM! And I fall over. And then the camera's, you know those shots of the camera's kind of pointing up at the sky through the cactus? And then a guy runs up and goes, ah! And pulls the 
hands up and I go, yeah, I don't think that's going in the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so we go out and we do it three more times. No. And, and did, my, it work, did it work? Yeah. <laughs> and my staff, my staff said, I've seen you do a lot of crazy shit, but this really crazy. takes the biscuit. <laughs> and so the, the next day I, I, went to the, I went to the doctor and he looked at me and he goes, what happened? And I go, I was hit by this robot drone. <laughs> and he goes, how did you get here? And I said, in a car. And he goes, you didn't drive yourself. And I go, yeah. And he goes, when you get someone to drive you home, you should not be driving. In fact, should I even be sitting up? So I was, I was, I was confined to the residence for a few days. And when I told the story to Rebecca, the Tucson steampunk, steampunk community officially named me Captain Drone Buster. <laughs> I had to send it back to Phoenix uh, oh, yeah. to repair the engine. My head is that hard. <laughs> okay, let me ask you a question. Okay. I got a question for, for the entire party. Since here we have a, a large number of people throughout the Vegas. Part of it. Hey, how many of you? Yeah, I know I resemble that remark too. Yeah. <laughs> who, has, who here has the lowest bacon number? Bacon? bacon? I don't even know what that is. Definitely Kevin bacon. separation between you and Kevin Bacon. bacon. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh, the I'm pretty oh, sure I don't have it's any. It's probably William, I would guess. <laughs> because you've got so I mean, many as far credits. Far as closest? Yeah. Well, I've met uh, him, but I guess it's... Once? Oh, yeah. Well, you've met him, so yeah. I've met him many, many times. Yeah, have you ever worked with him? I've never actually been in a film with him, but we work on plays. Hang on, mine is not work. <laughs> I'm, a two. I'm a two. I'm a two. Wow. I'm a two because I know. I well, I've met um, Jim Lovell, the real Jim Lovell, right. Commander of Apollo 13, who consulted on the film. Right? Kevin Bacon was one? Fred Hayes yes. in Apollo 13. So it's that kind of oh, two. If I know Lovell, that's close enough. Okay. God, I never thought I'd win a thing like that. <laughs> close yeah, to Kevin I, Bacon. That's I, yeah. really horrific. I, I, I have a Bacon number of two. Uh, because I was in a movie that was directed, the second assistant directors were Cliff Coleman and Eddie Milkovich. Okay. Eddie Milkovich and Cliff Coleman were the second assistant directors on Animal House, which is oh. Kevin's first movie. Yeah. And they directed me, so therefore I actually have a legitimate <laughs> number of two. Is this a movie thing? Your Kevin Bacon number? Yep. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I've never really heard that is. before. It's a movie. Yeah. I think that's the one you're saying. The way that IMDb is able to say, like, oh. how close no. related you are. Well, you know, I, I don't love it. Live next door to one. There's a variation of Bacon. But why is it Kevin Bacon out of everyone? Yeah, why not? It started that way. Did he just love the murder? On a scale of zero and one. Where are you? Okay, let me ask you another question. What is the most popular Bacon number in the film? Found moment you have had this uh, panel on a film, <laughs> panel. Oh. On a film set, which I guess technically is a film. Really. What's the most profound? I mean, right. can think of a profound moment. I got yeah. another extra story. I remember when the extras, several hundred of them, rioted on a movie. Actually, it was a TV movie. I'm going to ask if anybody's ever seen this. It was called Honey Boy with Eric Estrada. And he, Honey Boy, Honey Boy with Eric Estrada, he played, uh, he played the fighter. He played a fight. It was a typical corny oh, fight thing. Oh, that, oh, uh, and uh, Morgan Fairchild was in it. Yeah. Morgan yeah. Fairchild was in it. In fact, I spent a week, oh, I, my I spent a week sitting at ringside right. beside Morgan Fairchild, and the other side of me was Milton Berle's brother. Joe, bro, you ever met Milton Berle's brother? But the two of them are the most foul people on their face of the earth, between Morgan Fairchild and Joe Burl, I think it was, or Phil Burl. And it, between the two of them, they did nothing but tell dirty stories and complain and bitch. I, we were ringside, and so I was, I had no lines, but I was, you know, a good extra because I got a screen time. And, and so there's Morgan Fairchild, there's him, and there's, la and I'll give you an example. Uh, honey Boy, Eric Estrada comes on, he comes on, it's a beautiful silk purple robe, and he's silk, things like this. And Morgan Fairchild sitting there goes, that motherfucker gets nicer costumes than I do. That was just <laughs> an example of Morgan Fairchild's observations while uh. we're sitting here. Okay, so we're at the L.A. Shrine Auditorium. I could have bring this as a weird place to film, too. We're at the L.A. Shrine Auditorium. We've got several hundred extras that we keep moving around, depending where the camera goes, right? So, so they keep moving them around. And they are feeding them bologna sandwiches. 
and they were given and they were they rioted. They, there was about 300 of them. They said, we're not going to do this anymore unless you start feeding us better. Yep. And, 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 and so they just, and they left. And they walked out. I don't know who organized them or anything. And so the, their, their solution was, this is the honest to God truth, their solution was, okay, we'll give them better than bologna sandwiches. Also hired Elvira, mistress of the dark, to entertain them during shot, between shots. <laughs> so Elvira comes in in full regalia, and for like three or four days, entertains the extras during the, during the shots. Oh, that's, oh, oh. So, that qualifies as a weird story. That's, 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 that's pretty weird. Okay. I'm writing extras. I, well, writing wow, extras, right? yeah. They yeah all I, I, well, I guess they do write. <laughs> I was made, when I did House on Hunter Hill, the opening scene is a, is a riot of supposedly mental patients, and I think they really emptied out <laughs> the real mental facility yeah. to get these people because we had a scene where they're supposed to riot, and I don't know, there was, there was probably 50 or 60 of them. And, um, and it's a scene where they're supposed to go crazy, we needed a naked girl, so I sent my assistant in and I said, girl, get in there. So she, she, she was in the middle of it. We, they start the riot, we're rolling cameras, and, the, and we go, cut, cut, cut. And we literally had to send in the ADs, like every AD and every person we could get into, like to start breaking them up because they just would not stop. You know? and, uh, it, it actually got kind of scary there for a minute. Like, Where did you get these? <laughs> Uh, that's a that's a weird way to make a living, though. I, if you've ever been a professional extra in Hollywood, you realize that you've got to be prepared from about six o'clock the night before on to get the phone calls, yeah. right. and you can't and, plan uh, <laughs> you can't plan anything in your life because if they'll call you up and say you got a tuxedo, okay, we'll be there at such and such at seven o'clock in the morning, and you go there and you don't know if you're going to be there for two hours or fourteen hours or so, twenty or, or twenty or, or thirty days, right. so or days or exactly, you have no idea what your day, you know, the actors know I'm going to be here all day, but, <laughs> but everybody else, the actors, the extras don't. Anyway. I have to excuse myself. Oh, yeah. and I, I, I want to first of all I want to thank everybody for being so kind oh. and, and having me at your convention. So I really appreciate it, and uh, everybody's been great. So I hope to see you guys again. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He's a director who knows how to make an exit. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay. profound moments. Yeah. Yeah. I had one. Go ahead. I have one. Profundity. Profundity. Okay. Uh, now, I'll give you an idea of the cast. And Fred still here because Fred will know the movie immediately. Michael Moriarty, Samuel Fuller, Andrew Duggan, Evelyn Keyes, June Havoc, Roni Blakely, and in her first big role, Tara Reid. We all had to literally live together for 18 days in the worst weather ever that Vermont had had. It's a Larry Cohen film, Fred's not here, or he would have known it immediately, it's Return to Salem's Lot. I, like an idiot, said I wanted to learn how to produce. So Fred said, come with me. I will make you a PA, because I hate casting directors, he, 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 I, I think I'm the only person who ever gets credit on any of his movies as a casting director. And uh, says, I'll teach you the business. Well, after the fourth day of, in, you know, who's going to go home in your turnaround? Not on the Larry Cohen movie. He wakes your butt up, throws you out of bed, he would do, he'd wake me up. And on the fourth day of not sleeping, because we shot second unit while the rest of the crew was sleeping, I realized at that moment, wow, this is really what filmmaking is about when you don't have a budget. And it really was one of the most eye-awakening moments for me, maybe because I got this left and so on, but I just went, now I really understand. And when it was all over, I, I, I turned to Larry and I said, you took me for 18 days on a film set. Imagine we had all, I mean, so, and some of those people like 11, 
you know, havoc and, and everyone, geez, they'd grown up in the business. We're talking about people who'd worked on big movies like Gone with the Wind. And here we were living communally in a courtyard, because we all had rooms, worst snowstorm, the t-shirt, as you said, the memorabilia, unfortunately mine fell apart, was a picture of a donkey, and it said, I froze my <coughs> off in Vermont on this movie. That's we all froze our ass off, running around in barely any damn clothes because you're moving so quickly with the camera. But that's what true filmmaking is about. And I realized, you know what? Because I didn't know a lot about actual filmmaking. I never went to a film school or anything like that. That was and that, 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 that <laughs> all kind of came Pretty together, and I went, yeah, that's film school. Yeah. <coughs> I, I think, a, uh, I, I guess, uh, Marty's <laughs> profound, but yeah, I guess I'll share something before I have to leave, his day job is calling, but uh, when I was eight years old, I was an extra in a movie that they shot here in, in Tucson, it was called Kidco, and... Uh,